assistant chair for the current session is Professor Shantanu Day, Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIT Kanpur. So now I hand over mic to Professor Shantanu Day to head the session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So today, uh, uh, this afternoon we have a session on uh, coal and biomass classification. And we have the first uh, keynote uh, uh, talk by Professor Frank Winter. So Professor Winter has finished his PhD in chemical engineering at TU Vienna. And he also did uh, habilitation uh, for TU Vienna itself. He headed the Christian Doppler laboratory for chemical engineering at high temperatures from uh, 2001 to 2008. So currently he is the head of the research division uh, chemical process engineering and energy technology at the Institute of Chemical, Environmental and Biological Engineering at UVM. He has been published more than 100 scientific papers in international peer reviewed journals and was chairman of several international conferences as well as of the International Energy Agency uh, Fluid Edge Weight uh, Conversion Program. So this year he has become the ICS Fellow and uh, I will now request uh, Professor Winter to deliver his talk. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. Uh, I have been working. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Of course, 
this is somehow a uh, correlation, somehow linked, uh, and uh, therefore it's expected to increase the standards of living uh, more ways this year. So this is a significant challenge. And of course, this is the inverse pyramid, uh, we call it like this. It's a, and of course, the major issue should be to avoid the waste. So not to have this waste at all. Uh, if you have the waste, you should reuse it. So use your shirt again or someone else after um, you have used it to recycle uh, the material. For instance, iron and steel, you can easily slice the recycled iron. Uh, recover here the energy out of the uh, materials. And if this is all that not possible or has been done before, uh, dispose and landfill it uh, safely. So this is a very important thing, this hierarchy. First, this step, then the next step, and so on. This is, I think, very important. Now, uh, also a not so nice picture, but a nice picture where is Austria. So this is Austria, I always say it's in the heart of Europe, from our point of view, and uh, this is Europe. Here, here you see the Atlantic Sea here, um, yeah. Italy, Germany, France, uh, Hungary, so here is Austria. And I want to show you as an example how we handle, how we manage our waste and how to do the installation. And um, first, uh, also European perspective, it's closer to India, I think. It's uh, the waste, uh, the amount of waste uh, in the range of uh, 250 million tons. Uh, this is only 28 EU countries. <coughs> Municipal solid waste is this year. So uh, most of it is uh, reused. And also under the control goes um, bio degradation. Uh, Some bar is landfill, and this here, this part here is incinerated. So it's about uh, 60 million tons uh, per year in Europe. So this is the potential uh, we want to focus on in this uh, presentation this week. Um, it's quite significant, and you should make best out of this uh, potential of this. 60 million tons uh, per year in Europe, EU 28 countries. Um, this is now an example of Austria. Uh, it's not a small country with about uh, with more than 8 million people, so maybe it's related to a city of uh, India. And here you see our waste incineration plants in Austria. They are in the eastern part. Uh, uh, west here, close to Graz, and uh, in the south, here is again the Atlantic Sea, here the Alps. Uh, now it's time for skiing. Um, there's already snow here. Yeah, this is just uh, some effort. Uh, Vienna is a very good example also because we have very good cooperation with our uh, uh, waste uh, municipal um, government and how to handle it and how to use it and to burn it in a safe and clean way. Here you see an overview of the waste generation in Austria in million tons per year. So it's, this uh, part is municipal solid waste in general. <coughs> this is a little bit more than 4 million tons per year. And hazardous waste is also significant. It's about 1.3 million tons per year size range. And sewage sludge, uh, of course, here without water, so the dry basis, it's much smaller. It's uh, 230,000 uh, tons per year in this range. However, usually sewage sludge is very highly diluted with water and only on the 5 or 3 percent basis. So there's much more water and we have uh, to, to uh, manage this very high amounts of water flow, sewage flow uh, in a city, <coughs> which is of course a big challenge. And uh, incineration can also help you to concentrate uh, the available materials, the elements, for instance phosphorus here in this sewage sludge and can maybe reuse it then as a fertilizer or use it as a phosphor, phosphate source for fertilizers. 
So these are the amounts, uh, the data for Austria. I will also give you later per capita again the amounts uh, per capita and here. What is inside this municipal solid waste? Uh, this is a detailed study uh, about the amounts on wind phases. So there's some residue waste, I will come later. And we have a sorting system in Austria, a very well developed sorting system about different uh, valuable materials like glass here, so glass, plastic, uh, textiles. Um, there's also some uh, <coughs> uh, reusable wood you can also use here. And uh, very important is metal here. And paper, we also use, uh, reuse it for uh, producing new paper and new glass and new metals here. So this is uh, this share is also quite significant. This reusable paper in the range of 16% on a daily basis. We also uh, separate electronics and problematic waste, plus uh, all some uh, yeah, processes or to go to benefit, but we remove it from the process of uh, the cycle. Uh, this is some strategic uh, historical development of how the waste is handled in Austria. Actually. So it's uh, uh, here in the year 2003-2004 uh, was a significant uh, change because uh, EU legislative was that uh, there should be not untreated waste put to landfill. So there should be a carbon content which is lower than 5%. Uh, and you should treat your waste before you put it to landfill and not uh, put it outside in the landfill just uh, there. So, and this was also an increase uh, in waste incineration uh, in Austria. So, we have uh, built up new plants, and now it's almost uh, uh, no uh, fully in force this legislative uh, directive. Uh, no no untreated uh, waste put to landfill and uh, the carbon contents lower than 5% or even lower than that. So most of the waste is, uh, goes here, uh, thermal treatment, so incineration here. Um, yeah, some uh, this is biological treatment. Uh, this is reusable waste like metals and glass and paper I've shown you before. And uh, yeah, some here also mechanical and biological treatment and no disposal of untreated waste anymore. Um, the composition of residual waste that I've mentioned before, here is a detailed picture of this residual waste, what is this, uh, its composition. And again, it's plastic. Plastic is biological, 20% uh, here in this range. Paper and other materials here, still some metals, some glass, inert material, textiles, fine materials, hygiene products, diapers, uh, in this uh, range of uh, residual waste, which has been not uh, uh, separated in our sorting systems. And uh, this, uh, most of this waste is going to incineration, so more than 80% is going to incineration. There will be lots of treatment, about 18% or 20%. <coughs> uh, but uh, this uh, incineration is also not only to recover, can be <coughs> not see not only to recover the energy, but also to use it as a concentration uh, device. So the incinerators, they concentrate in certain aspects uh, the mass flows. You get it separated, and I will come to this uh, uh, point later. But this is an opportunity for urban mining. Uh, first, also, I will have a look at the sewage sludge again, so 235,000 tons per year on a dry basis. So, this is much of a significant area, it's only 3% uh, in, usually in the sewage uh, sludge and uh, sewage system. So we have much more water to have, of course, and to concentrate. And we have, uh, usually you have to deal with that Swiss sludge with 30% um, uh, dry substance. You see here also, most of the sludge is going to incineration in Austria. And some is used as fertilizers already, and other treatment like 
spectacle and composting here is uh, also done here as such. I mean, you have to be careful in general, also if, if you want to use this fertilizer, that uh, use the heavy metals in the sewage sludge from the city. So you have to be careful about the chemical contents and if you use the sludge material. Uh, um, also, hazardous waste is a important issue, so it's a range of 1.3 million tons per year. Uh, hazardous waste is uh, a wide range of materials. It's from hospitals to uh, soil, ground contaminated by oil, uh, for instance, and also asbestos, and uh, many, many different types of materials are here. So it's not so easy to handle it. Uh, and the significant share is also on the incineration, a higher share for recycling and uh, for chemical physical treatment. You get uh, some, usually they are high in uh, metals, also in heavy metals, so you have to be careful here and uh, use it if possible. But I don't want to uh, have the time here to focus on hazardous waste. This is the share per capita in. Austria, so this is now per capita and year. So in the range of, um, yeah, we have about 8.7 million people here. And um, municipal soil waste in general is in range of uh, 480 to 500 uh, kilograms per capita and year. Here is the detailed study. Hazardous waste in the range of 150 kilograms and sewage sludge on dry basis, uh, 27 kilograms per capita per year. And these figures are quite um, in a wide range of many countries, so they're quite, uh, uh, you can use it as, of course, as estimation, but uh, uh, yeah, you can calculate the number of population, it's, uh, you can uh, use this here. Depending, of course, on the uh, also uh, level of GDP. What is inside? This is on elemental basis on chemistry. Uh, so most of it is carbon. This is kilogram per ton of waste on a dry basis, uh, based as we see. So we have the carbon here. This has to be lower as to. Uh, can be used and formed to energy. The energy can be used. We have also quite a significant amount of iron, silicon, calcium, aluminum is increasing also in time, chloride, sulfur, and some like sodium, potassium, zinc. And of course, we have heavy metals like uh, cadmium and mercury. So we have to be careful here because of heavy metals and to separate them and uh, use it in a good uh, cleaning system for your incineration process. So this is uh, a scheme of the process for incineration. And this is the idea, actually, not only to incinerate, so to have this uh, link to energy, producing heat and uh, power, um, but also looking to the material flows. And this incineration process is a big concentrator. <coughs> Look at this respect from this perspective, and you have here a very high flow of municipal soil waste, and you use its energy, and at the same time you separate, and uh, this has different fractions of uh, the materials. Like you generate fly ash from your combustion process, and slag bottom ash from your combustion process, from the cleaning process. Look at cleaning, you use uh, you have the filter cake, and you have now opportunities uh, to uh, use these uh, uh, flows for uh, urban mining. Urban mining is, of course, you can think of a city as a big mine, and you dig your metals out of this mine or your uh, valuables, and um, of course, the whole flow is uh, very high. You have 4 million tons per year here, but you have significantly lower amounts here and also um, lower, smaller uh, volume flows here. Mass flows are lower and also volume flows are smaller. 
And here it's, you can see already, you can start here before incineration process. Sometimes it's good for incineration to remove uh, some fractures. Or you do it here in the concentration, uh, concentrated mass flow with the butter mesh, for instance, and to get uh, values out of this flow or large or even filter <coughs> gate. What does this mean in detail? This, <coughs> you see here the uh, scheme of a incineration process, uh, and here is the flue gas cleaning process. So here is the combustion chamber furnace, and here you have the heat exchangers for steam production, powered steam, and the cleaning starts here. So we have a very good cleaning, which is very important. Our waste incinerators are usually in Vienna, are close in the city, so to have this acceptance uh, from people, it's important to have a um, very high quality of flue gas cleaning. Technologies are also used in a wide range. You have uh, great furnaces, fluidless beds, and all turquoise. So these three major technologies are used for waste uh, for incineration. And um, Hessner's waste is usually burned here in the rotary kiln. Uh, we see for solid waste in great furnace or fluid beds. However, for fluid beds, you need uh, sorted waste uh, before uh, uh, combustion process to uh, guarantee, uh, 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 this is to guarantee uh, the fluidization state. Now I give you show you some expression or some pictures how it's uh, handled in manner. So we have the, those trucks, uh, they are collecting the waste from uh, waste bins usually. Uh, several waste bins are put here into this truck. And uh, here's the entrance to the bunker system, the bunker, uh, for the waste incinerator, which is a great furnace in this case. Here we have a few inside the bunker. You see here this residual salt waste here, this residual waste. Uh, in the bunker, which is of quite a uh, significant size. And here you see a crane, and the crane is used to fill up the tubes for the crate furnace. So the, the crane operator is a very important person to mix the fuel and to uh, feed the different uh, combustion lines in the optimized way. Yeah, this is a few inter, uh, such a combustion generator. Um, it's also here, in this case, a great furnace, and you can see the flames here. And on the next picture, you see it also this. Here is the crate, the bottom is the crate furnace, and you see here the flames in the uh, combustion zone. And here is the uh, ash, uh, so this is going to the ash uh, removal here, to the front side. <coughs> And you see here the combustion process. And you can also uh, see, uh, you can, if you have a good uh, experience, you can see about the quality of this combustion process here. And you have secondary injection, of course, to minimize NOx, uh, also if you have full uh, burnout, which is a very important issue. This is also one uh, artistic picture from, uh, but uh, this is the plant. The, a fluid is better incinerated and lit. You see here the river Danube. Um, yeah. And this is close to the harbor and uh, very good location and very good also to use it for district heating, which is an important issue in Austria to heat um, the different uh, areas and uh, <coughs> houses. So you see here also a very long transport line because uh, the amount of score here. Um, this gives us such um, some typical numbers. Uh, this is one example. It's a uh, Spitelau unit, which is quite famous because also of its design from the park <coughs> in the And uh, two lines, and uh, total capacity is 250,000 tons per year, and uh, has been renewed uh, quite recently. And uh, thermal power is uh, 50, so close to 60 megawatts thermal, and electric is uh, 50 megawatts. And great uh, furnace, and you see here the full uh, range of gas <coughs> cleaning. You see Bengals filter with activated coke injection, scrubber, 
once cover two and the removal plan for locks and um, also biopsies and so catalytic uh, reduction. And here also I give you some numbers, some actual numbers for um, typical numbers for Spitelau. One ton of waste is here, and you'll see the different mass flows. It's a filter cake is the smallest amount, the highest is here the bottom measure 10%. Some flash 2% and some scrap uh, ferrous and non ferrous metal 1.7% here uh, based on uh, the input waste flow. So you see also a significant reduction in mass. This is a, a Linz unit, which is a fluid bed, so a different technology. And you see here uh, lower amounts of water mesh, but high amounts of flash. So here, close to 10% of flyage and over 50% pop mesh. Um, not uh, so low as crest, fair as non fair as, because it's usually connected before. Filter cake is in the same range. Yeah, what are the conclusions? Uh, as I mentioned already, it's the significant uh, reduction in mass. So one fifth is uh, realistic in big size of the mass reduction. This is a very high concentration. Even higher if you look to the volume flows. So it's about one tenth of the base volume flow is reduced. And so it's uh, uh, two one tenth is reduced and nine tenths are uh, uh, removed, if you want to uh, say so. So it's a highly concentrated flow from a big city, and you can um, dig there much easier for vegetables as before. You have the destruction of organic content. You have a control concentration, I mentioned before. Of course, the pollutants you have to handle very well. And uh, you have to spend it with also chemical zinc for separation purposes, like it's done in Sweden, for instance. The separation of metals, and of course, electricity and heating is uh, available. And I want to acknowledge the energy agency for this great commercial group, very active. And if you have the opportunity, uh, it would be great to see you in Vienna in October, this October, this October already, so 2018. Uh, in Vienna, it's about um, based information and based energy. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Winter, for your nice presentation uh, on the practices, how to treat municipal services of interest by incineration. So if you have any questions, I'll just have to ask. Any questions? Oh, yeah. My comment, you reported the elements in the municipal soil base. Yes, the suggestion is that there are many kilogram fresh time of base. Yeah. If the heating value of the base is very low, yeah. Then I have to fire more, so it's kind of the report below the line of giga dose of energy release. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good uh, comment. Um, yeah, it's the, as I wanted to say, this way of thinking. If you are thinking from the electricity and heat side, uh, it's uh, completely correct. I wanted to also bring this aspect from the mass flow and uh, material flows and how much you can get and win. Um, yeah, so it's. Uh, I'm always, I'd like to bridge both worlds actually. Is there, is there any more question? Uh, actually, sir, I want to uh, know that uh, in a country like India, here the saturation of waste is generally not uh, being available. It means whatever waste we have, we have a mixture of glass waste, material waste, weight of waste. So, when this kind of system is most appropriate to uh, reuse this waste. So see if I am giving a simple example. Uh, in my city, Ahmedabad, the total waste is generally 9,000 ton. So, if we are talking about one area, here the a big mountain of the waste, probably the 20 story building. So, it means huge waste mountain and uh, continuously some smokes are exerting from that uh, this mountain. 
So this which is the proper way to reuse or recycle that particular waste. Right, right. So with waste incineration, you this is a practical data, of course. Uh, you can reduce to 10% or 10%, so from 100% you can reduce the volume to 10%. And at the same time you destroy uh, pollutants, organic uh, pollutants in the material, you can use uh, the, heat, the energy actually, and you get uh, with the potential get the materials, <coughs> metals for instance, it's the easiest, a fairest, non -fairest metals out of this uh, big pile, of this big mountain. So I think um, there are different technologies available and some technologies are more flexible to a wide distribution of waste, some are more to a specific waste fraction um, optimized. So there is uh, this potential and I think um, there can be limited, only limited uh, pretreatment can be done and it can be incinerated. And what is important of course uh, with a very good fuel gas system, fuel gas emission system. But uh, then we really can make out, so you can use this potential.
His research projects dealt with energy conversion from coal and biomass, uh, group combustion, alternate biofuels, gasification and emission of NOx and mercury. He is the author of about 150 journal and reviewed conference publications, mostly in the area of combustion and gasification of coal and biomass. Uh, he is a member of Combustion Institute and a fellow of American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He serves on the editorial boards of several journals. So I welcome Professor uh, Anna Malai uh, for this uh, talk. So he will be delivering a talk on biomass energy, agricultural and non-agricultural sources, and upgrading and conversion processes, benefits and problems. Thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction. Uh, I think the title should be more like a recent trends in biomass energy conversion because my uh, slides are, seem to be focusing more on that. Uh, I'm very glad to come back to Indians of Science here. I got my master's from the institute a long time back, once upon a time, I say. And then I worked for about two years before I moved to Georgia Tech to get my PhD. So when they invited me to come and be a keynote, see, I'm, I'm just retired. I'm called Paul Professor Emeritus. I was thinking whether to come or not, you know. But I thought I should pay back. Government of India support my education for engineering. Without that, I would not have got my bachelor's degree at all. So I should do something. So I can institute. I want to come back to the institute. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, the several sponsors to the project here, actually I am giving what we have done over about 10 years with the support from various agencies on energy conversion. I listed them here. Primarily, most of the money, as usual, came from Department of Energy and Department of Air Gold and Colorado and Pittsburgh here. And the rest of them are industrial contracts, except the US Department of Agriculture here. The contributing authors, I think probably I would request a manuscript for a draft later. And <coughs> they already wrote this draft for me. And myself is a PI on several projects. And Mr. Danapal, he is the one who has uh, done the draft on this paper. As well as he has done extensive experiments on gasification of FB, I will explain that it's called feedlot biomass or animal gas. And Mr. Jin Ho is a Korean student and he did work on V1 system where we are going to show it to you that you can use animal waste in a boiler fired with coal, I can reduce the nitric cost of the emission by 90%. And he has done some experiments and I'm going to show the results. And Mr. V Chen, we did a gasification of the biomass or misfit trees. And Bernardo Gordillo, who is a professor in Columbia, did gasification of the dairy biomass or dairy animal based female gasification. And finally, my colleague here for almost 30 years, we worked with the various projects down in Sweden here. Okay, I divided my talk into various parts here introduction brief, and the properties, what's the problem with the biomass fuel compared to coal, and the various energy conversion process processes here. I won't go through all of them in detail here, only three of them I'm going to select here. And finally, we were publishing some paper recently, translating the results from medical field to the engineering field here, something called respiratory portion technique. I can use it to estimate the carbon dioxide emitted by your car online basis. You can use any fuel you want to. It will tell you CO2 in tons per gigawatts. And the benefits and problems. Introduction here. I know people talk about global warming and uh, the rise in temperature. What happens to the first rise in temperature? If you take a thermodynamics course, you know that if the ocean temperature rises, saturation pressure increases. There is going to be more evaporation, more water vapor in the sky. Whatever goes up has to come back as a rain. So there will be more rain and more rain, more inches of rain here as well as the barometric pressure will become lower and lower over the ocean. So the wind speed will increase here. There's a lot of evidence I have. I got a separate slice of carbon dioxide, the wind speed measurement, the temperature rise, all those things. But I can't give all those details here. 
So recently, about a month back, Houston got almost 60 inches, or about uh, and converted in centimeter here, about 120 centimeters of rain within about a day. And the whole city got flooded almost. My son was living there. I live about 100 miles from Houston. Here's a picture of Houston, how it looks like here. And this all, I think, believed to be due to global warming. Okay, what are the two kinds of Okay, in order to reduce the carbon dioxide emitted by these fossil fuels, which are your digging carbon out of the ground, converting them to carbon dioxide, so people are proposing that we have to use the renewable biomass fuels here because it takes a carbon dioxide from air, converts back into fuel, and you burn it on circulation. So, agricultural biomass fuel, like corn, sugarcane, biscuit, all those things. Non-agricultural based biomass, I have to say that animal based material, uh, chicken manure, sewage, such, all those things. There is the other non-agricultural biomass, I call them, is a processed agricultural biomass fuel, except that it's a biomass fuel, it's not a biomass, it creates a big mess. This includes the manure from the pigs, cattle, Diaries and poultry here. The reason being, Texas has almost like a 6 million or 10 million cattle in a small city area. They generate 110 million tons per year or something like that. And so there are no mountains in Texas, but you can see animal based mountains, you know. So they want some technology to convert that into energy. So we test, conduct a lot of experiments on it. Okay, how did we get to this research, you know, just by accident, uh, because the agriculture engineering department professor called me up, you we know, have a problem with animal waste, they said, I am a combustion guy, how do you uh, solve this problem, I said, I can burn them in the existing coal fired power plant, uh, mixing with coal here, how do you get graduates to work on this one, I go on the horse and catch them, you know. Okay. What are the fuel properties which creates problem in using this biomass here? And these are the various references I have. What are the big problem is that biomass has less energy. On a dry ash free basis, coal has about 30,000 kilojoules per kilogram. To take biomass or biomass, that means animal waste, on a dry ash free basis of 20,000, two thirds of that here. Therefore, if I want to use this fuel in a coal-fired system here, I have to fire more biomass here. So heating value is low. It also reduces due to the increased moisture of ash here. Here is a comparison of biomass versus coal here. Unfortunately, this America goes metric inch by inch. Therefore, the, the report still in BT power basis here, you can multiply by 2.3 to get a kilojoules per kilogram, that comes to 20,000 kilojoules per kilogram. And uh, here is the chicken waste here, you can see here it is 15,000 kilojoules per kilogram here. And one of the problems we are having here is the nitrogen content is way high in the biomass fields. In other words, animal waste contains almost 10 times more nitrogen compared to coal. So if I want to use this in a coal-fired power plant here by mixing this animal waste with coal, my nitrogen content is going to go up, NOx is going to shoot up. That is what we expected, but nature has its own way of doing the things here, we didn't know it until the end. Okay, we talk about it, that's a good nitrogen, bad nitrogen. We found our coal seems to have a bad nitrogen, animal waste has a good nitrogen in the form of urea. And urea is a process used to reduce the nitric oxide by exon. They are bad for it. So somehow you will see some, there's a reduction now because of that. Okay, next thing is to determine the fuel properties. I have to know what is the moisture content. I have to know what is the volatile matter, ash, fixed carbon, the remaining material here. What is the pyrolysis temperature, increase in temperature. We use the thermogrammetric analyzer here, where we load up the samples and heat it up. And this one, I'll go back to here. 
Okay, and this y axis here, somebody disappears in this world computer. Let's see something. I want to get all of that. Thank you. Why don't you use the presenter? There is even more yeah. slightly. Mass percentage versus temperature here, you get the trace value. So about, there is about 10 or 20 percent moisture here. So first it removes the moisture until about 100 degrees centigrade, but no gases come out. Then around 300 degrees centigrade, the volatile matter starts coming out. It's the, just a mixture of carbon monoxide, various hydrocarbons, alcohols, all those things. Then I see a rapid mass loss here. Then I have this chalk plus ash left over here. So we can determine this, this is called proximate analysis for the uh, fuel. And typically, coal as a char is about uh, 40, 60 percent, almost 40 percent volatile matter for the coal. But for the biomass fuel, volatile matter is almost like 80 percent on dry ash free basis. The char is very less here. So it has more volatile matter. It's good for combustion, actually, compared to uh, coal. Okay. Here is a okay. The pyrolysis temperature, if you compare with coal, it starts pyrolysing around the 650 degree Kelvin. That's the biomass, and this is later in chicken biomass, and this is cattle biomass here. They are around the uh, lesser temperature compared to coal. Here, the 500 degree Kelvin. All the agriculture waste also are on the same value here, like this. Okay, now one of the various energy conversion process we adopted. These are the various process by various, when you did the work for the various contract. The first one is the tarifaction process. It's upgrading of the field to increase the heating value of the biomass from 20,000. How much I can increase it? Because the transportation of the biomass is expensive, the heat value is very low because we are transporting more uh, mass but low quality. And the next one is uh, how do you convert from uh, biomass into gas and oil and using pure pyrolysis and partial oxidation using the gasifiers, direct energy conversion to the co fire We have done a lot of experiments, I am not going to talk about it. Direct energy conversion to the reborn penis. So I told you about the nitric oxide, we are going to talk about some other experiment. And finally, I'm not going to talk about this one. And recently I started working with a company in Houston. They are interested in municipal solid waste, they will have zero emission in their system, they say. And I think as a consultant to this company here. Upgrading, this is the publication we have in this area. What is the field upgrading? Fuel typically has volatile matter, fixed carbon, ash and water here. Easy way to do it is to first remove the water, dry it up. The heating value rises, of course, water does not have any heating value. Next thing is to remove the ash also if you can, so the heating value increases. See, so this is what are two of the process to increase the heating value of the fuel here. And then finally, there is one more process here. The volatile matter we talk about in the biomass it's a mixer of alcohols, a lot of oxidized compounds here, plus some hydrocarbons. What they do in the tariff act, remove those oxidized compounds from the volatile matter, then we find that the heating value increases. Not only that, when you do the tariff act, that's called tariff act process. Tariff act is nothing but removing the oxygen and the compounds from volatile matter. So fuel will have more carbon content, which increases the heating value. One important advance we have on this uh, a tarification process is that the fuel left over is easily grindable compared to the original biomass after tarification process. So I can mix it coal, I can grind it, make the same fine as the coal itself after tarification. Because the world element consists of lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, and water here. Cellulose is nothing but an oxidized compound, hemicellulose of the oxidized compound. You remove part of it, not completely. Okay, here is an experiment we performed here. This, is, this article has been published in Fuel Journal recently. Mark 8 percentage. What we do is that we take this sample here, put in the TG apparatus, let the nitrogen flow through that, then heat it up, say, around 20 degrees centigrade or 10 degrees centigrade per minute, go up to 250 degrees centigrade. For example, here, I have this one here. So I keep on heating it up. Then what I do is that once I reach this temperature, 250 degrees centigrade, maintain this temperature constant. 
and keep paralyzing it here. Similarly, I will go up to say a 400 degree centigrade, maintain this temperature, keep paralyzing. So we have conducted the experiments using the constant temperature for various constant temperatures here. Then remove the samples by the heating wire. So we have done this experiment in the environment, argon environment, as well as carbon dioxide. But with the carbon dioxide, we find there is more mass loss compared to organ. Reason being, carbon dioxide reacts with carbon and opens up some of the pores from the field and more volatile matter is coming out here. So mass loss rate is more rapid with the carbon dioxide compared to organ here. And here are the results we have. And original virgin biomass here is 1666 kilojoules per kilogram. By nitrogen tarifaction, we have almost 50,000. And other and carbon dioxide are right here. So, heating value has gone up by 20% more during part the tarifaction process here. Not only that, we can also grind it. And we showed that the improvement in grinding process for this biomass here is almost the same as that of the gold. So here are the samples of the tarified biomass here, the virgin biomass. Here is a tarified biomass here. So we have conclusion on the tarifaction process is that, is that best tarifaction conducted between 240 to 260 degrees centigrade here. Carbon dioxide causes higher amount of weight loss. Tarifaction improves the fuel properties. <coughs> Heating values become higher, easily grindable. But you have to be careful with carbon dioxide because sometimes we lose more masses if the temperature is very high. Okay, next one is the pure pyrolysis. We have done this uh, experiment on a contract basis. There is a sustainable energy corporate in Houston. When the gas price, the oil prices were very high, they were conducting a pyroscale test using soybean seeds. And they produced oil. And uh, they asked us to evaluate the technology because the investor wanted to invest money uh, in making this as a commercial process, wanted to get technology to be evaluated. So we went and performed experiments on it. What is this process they are using? They take a raw, raw soybean seeds and then put it in a cylindrical drum and keep it a vacuum pressure of 5 psi or in, uh, in uh, metric system, it's around 20 kilopascal pressure. Heat it up around 600 degrees centigrade, uh, 300, 300 to 400 degrees centigrade. Then they find that they take, take the gases, they find that oil is being produced here. So we get two kinds of oil. One is called heavy oil, other is the light oil. Then leftover char also produce some gases coming in the exhaust stack here. So if you try to heat it up, and the vacuum pressure here, I produce heavy oil, light oil, char, and this. And we determine the composition of this, heating value of this one. And then determine the composition, heating value of this one. And then, do the experiment, the hot gas attempt to is passed on to a cop oil, what do they call it? Cop oil, they call it knockout pot oil or something. This oil produced in the previous experiments. So they, Take the gases from here and blow through this one, and then the condensed out the oil here. This oil is a heavy oil. Then take the gases out again here. There's a low temperature cooling system. This high temperature cooling system here. Produce the next one. Next stage is this is a heavy oil, and next is a light oil. This light oil has more moisture, so heating value will be lower. Here is a photograph of the precipitate that we use for making oil. What we find is that 60% of the mass of the soybean seed has been converted to oil. 20% of the char, 20% of the gases in the exhaust. The heating value of the gas value is 46. We didn't produce a gas in the I want to compare this. This has this heating value. Heavy oil heating value is look at it 40,000. It is kind of not exactly the same as the gas in the diesel here. The light oil has low heating value because there's more water in the the gas produces a heating value of 8,970 kilojoules per kilogram. It's almost the same as the low BD gas versus the gas fires. Okay, that is a pure pyrolysis. We also performed a large number of experiments using gasifiers. 
these are various publications. We had an outer of catching fires. So we dump the fuel from the top and blow the air from the bottom. So I can change this air to pure oxygen if you want to, or oxygen plus nitrogen, or steam plus oxygen here. So it comes through that. So what we find is that as you dump the fuel here, first we dry the fuel. So dry layer is here, pyrolysis layer, and there's a reduction layer here, this is oxidated. The fixed carbon is getting oxidated because the oxygen is available immediately here. This fixed carbon oxidation is the one cause keeping the temperature hot here. I produce gases here, we measure the composition, CO, CO2, CO2, and determine the heating value. Typically, the heat value produced here is about 5600 kilos per standard cubic meter. We compare this with the natural gas, it's about 10 percent of the natural gas heating value. Here's the experimental facility. So, supply steam and air at the bottom, drop the fuel. The gas has come out, I, I can either take it out or go through a condensing unit and there is a mass spectrometer determined all the composition here. Okay. We also developed a, a, small, a theoretical analysis on this. Can I predict the heating value of the biomass gases coming out of the gasifier just using the approximate analysis of the field? Yes, we could do that. And I don't want to go through all the equations here. So what we done is that we have a program on this one. Calculate the heating value of any given fuel, could be biomass, coal, or, or, or animal waste, or anything. And just I need the proximal analysis. I need the moisture, ash, and fish carbon, and the volatile matter here. I can tell you what kind of quality of gases you're going to produce using the gasifier. And the equation use solid mass. Heat, volatile matter carbon ash plus a moisture here. The charge is assumed to go to CO and get the heat released here. Again, the steam is assumed to react with carbon produce CO to H2. And, uh, and then I determine the heating value of all this, uh, the gases here. And here is the experimental data on the heating value of the, or the coal. Heating value measured is 6.55 kilos per standard cubic meter, 11% uh, natural gas predicted is 11.7. It's good for the uh, coal, it agrees very well, but biomass is not agree well. I know the reason why, but I won't discuss that this time. I can answer it if anybody asks the question later. Okay, direct energy conversion. I only need for five more minutes here. We had a rebirth process and the reason being, nitrogen in coal is very low, only 0.54 kilograms per gigajoules. In animal waste, like cattle manure, it's almost four times higher. So the boiler people said, if it mixes animal waste with coal, I'm going to produce more NOx. So I don't want this to be the same. I told them that we won't mix it, too, only about 10 percent we're going to mix it, not 20 percent. So NOx will not go up that much. Actually, in the plant experiment, NOx actually went down, not well. So we thought, oh, we you know the reason why it's urea. Okay, let's see what happens here. What's the rebirth process? You burn coal in a boiler, you put it there, and then you produce 400 ppm of NOx here. What they were doing in the past to satisfy the EPA limits, they were injecting natural gas as a rebirth fuel and reduce the NOx. So they could 160 ppm acceptable to the EPA here. What we suggested to them, don't put natural gas now, put this animal waste there, see what happens. And then look at it, 400 ppm, it went to put 40 ppm. So the reason being this ammonia type of nitrogen is coming out here, it reacts with NOx per milliard, reduce them to molecular nitrogen. So we conduct experiments on it, we prove uh, so I'm going to skip this right here. And we bury the what we did as a river field, we used a pure animal waste plus a blend of coal and animal waste here. As you put more and more animal waste here, my reduction is very, very high. So these are all the small scale experiments. We also did a large scale, bioscale experiment here as a department of energy. And 
they got exact they went there and the experiment too the reduction is almost <coughs> unbelievable results we took a pattern based on this what should be the air fuel ratio and all those things here okay and uh, just briefly mention this all to you but okay a couple of so there this is a very recent technique we published a paper is coming up in 2008 it will come up in a journal respirator portion technique how i can measure co2 online when you are driving a car you got a fuel gauge according to i pass the level of carbon dioxide gauge it will tell you how many kilograms are in your terms of energy release here yeah, in many so once you fill up your tank i know how much gigawatt you have used it so i can tell how many tons because you know we need as a tax taxation on carbon dioxide we have an exact method that was based on this concept here what is the respiratory question this was a portion used in the medical field we burn our fuel also we burn glucose in our body so we exhaust in carbon dioxide oxygen so this is a doctor measures how many co2 moles for the output you are consuming that's the rp typically for glucose this is one every one mole of food you can see for glucose oxidation produce one mole of co2 then we went to some derivation i did the same thing for coal biomass and all those things then we got a relation so <coughs> in tons per gigajoules is nothing but rp number of fuel divided by ton we can prove this theoretically we derive this expression theoretically and so in other words if i can get rp value for the car exhaust i can do using gas analysis i can get your co2 in tons per gigajoules and this is for the non human engines for the human engine also i can tell you that how much CO2 in tons per gigawatt you are releasing but you are using renewable fuels not uh, a coal or biomass and I can uh, this is related this RP how we are aging biological aging I can relate this aging if I can measure the RP value from the nose <coughs> okay I am going to skip this section here we have time here and we have all these results in the three volume DOE equals other way about 10 and I will turn up my colleagues here which has a detailed research on the catalytic properties here all the external data we have so the gasification and oil does not require much of processing here but to fire in the existing boilers you have to go through some process here particularly wet biomass not easy to grind and the proximate method we developed of predicting the heating value of the gas from any biomass or coal here, direct energy conversion. And we find that unveiled base surprisingly has a good nitrogen, which is reduced to marks here. And recently we developed the RQ methodology to rank this field based on the CO2 diet for power plants with low RQ fuel. Lower the RQ of the fuel is lower the CO2 emissions in the plant. Thank you.
So first talk is uh, from Vandali uh, Bhuri and Prabhu uh, Bharat uh, from Ayat Bharati. So the topic is uh, thermogalimetric analyzer uh, studies on direct hole to air chemical lobing combustion under nitrogen and CO2 atmosphere.
the similar frame was observed till 600 degrees celsius however upon increasing the temperature a different frame was observed and a uh, nickel oxide uh, showed a lower reactivity than Fe2O3 this was mainly because the sulfur uh, the pole was characterized by blue ash and high sulfur content the sulfur got converted into sox emission and the nickel oxide was easily deactivated uh, with the sox emission and as such it, uh, its uh, reactivity was uh, hindered whereas uh, Fe2O3 did not show such did not show such <coughs> results and thus it produced a high result as we all know that CO2, as we all know that uh, CO2 will have a higher reactivity than that of the nitrogen atmosphere, and we observed that in the, in volatile condition, 10% increase was observed in CO2 condition than the nitrogen atmosphere. For tar, it was around 25%, and for the char, the it was around uh, 80 to 99.28%. That is, the CO2 promotes the uh, coal gasification with the metal oxide. Now this is the conversion plot where we observed that the nickel oxide showed a higher conversion than that of the uh, ap 2 uh, in uh, inert atmosphere around 70% and 45% and uh, since, the, uh, metal, uh, since the nickel oxide has higher reactivity towards the volatile content, so there was a steep increase in this uh, 400-600 degree Celsius temperature range. Now in CO2 atmosphere, uh, uh, it also showed that higher reactivity in the nickel oxide as compared to the uh, epitopic metal oxide. Now from this I would like to conclude that the charred metal oxide uh, with nickel oxide uh, with nickel oxide uh, showed a higher reactivity in nitrogen atmosphere whereas with CO2 atmosphere metal uh, iron oxide showed a higher reactivity for the charred metal oxide condition. Uh, charred conversion with uh, nickel it showed higher reactivity, uh, higher conversion in terms in nitrogen as well as in CO2 atmosphere. From this, I would finally like to conclude that the direct utilization of coal in chemical routine combustion is feasible using CO2 as a gas tank medium. Uh, these are the references. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions.
but we have, we have to take into account the energy efficiency also. So both air and steam has been utilized. So the present work is as part of um, an MNRA sponsored project, air steam gasification of biomass to generate biohydrogen in a bubbling fluid iceberg gasifier. Then I'm presenting only, only the modeling, simulation only. So you can have various modeling approaches like uh, black box uh, thermodynamic equilibrium model, a kinetic model, you can have CFD based model, you can have experimental data based model. I'm concentrating on only on this chemical kinetic modeling because this gasification, the global reaction can be divided into several sub blocks, several sub reactions, I mean. So the chemical kinetics, the kinetic concept of this each and every chemical reaction is actually controlling the yield of the product. So we have to have more concentration on this um, chemical uh, reaction constants. So uh, we have followed the chemical process simulation model for ASTM and gasification. The major objective is to have uh, the prediction of uh, the yield of the various gasification products. A parametric variation study has been conducted. So of course uh, we have used uh, this chemical process simulator Aspen Plus for simulating the entire process. And this is um, the approximate and ultimate analysis data of the gasification process, sorry, the biomass containing fixed carbon, moisture, volatiles, and the CHO, etc. And uh, the gasification process itself, we can divide it into several, uh, several uh, sub reactions. So these are uh, some of the reactions which are taking place, especially the star gasification, then um, water gas shift reaction, the powder reaction the steam ethane reforming etc. So all these 10 reactions have been considered in terms of its kinetic constants and uh, these have been inbuilt <coughs> in the uh, Aspen Plus model. So this is uh, the process flow diagram. I'm going to explain it in very detail because of the interest of time. So we have to, we have to dry the biomass then has to be, um, it has to undergo the pyrolysis which produces oils, gases, char and char and etc. The char which is uh, non-condensable condensable hydrocarbons which is undergoing the steam reforming reaction and also the volatiles including the oil and gas so that is being uh, reformed in the reformation reaction after undergoing the combustion and also we have ash content so we have taken 25% ash sorry 25% of the char but not involving the chemical um, reaction named as unconverted char etc and of course we have ash also and uh, this is based on a uh, unique uh, model that means the pyrolysis has been simulated in, in real estate that is the pyrolytic products, the gas, tar, tar, etc. So we have a separate um, function, the subroutine has been uh, done in a uh, separate program has been coded in um, Aspen Plus and uh, this is based on this Gomez Barrow et al. Uh, paper. So he gives um, the yield of gas, tar, tar and also the several uh, gas percentages on dry basis. So we have used, used that uh, to simulate the pyrolysis process and this is a sub block description that includes the sociometric reactions and their split mixers etc i'm not going to explain it in detail and also it consists of a plug reaction which actually simulates the combustion and uh, the parametric variation has been done by using a data analyzing tool available in aspen plus and we want to have the parametric variation of equivalence ratio that is sub sociometric gas supply the steam to biomass ratio, how much the steam have supplied, of course the temperature is an allothermal process. So what should be the temperature that should be kept inside the gas cooler for uh, yielding hydrogen in more content. So and we have the correlations as the respected professor was saying, LHP that is um, low heating value of the dry gas in terms of the ultimate analysis data. Why means it is the volume fraction and of course energy efficiency we have taken into account that is first flow efficiency. How much how effective is this gasification process that is expressed in terms of the energy efficiency and also we have taken into account the XRG efficiency XRG generally means it is a second law thermodynamic efficiency which accounts the irreversibility associated with the, the whole process and these are uh, some of the uh, results yeah. so this is uh, the variation of the hydrogen first one and you can see the carbon dioxide uh, <coughs> percentage variation also so you can see as the temperature increases, uh, we can have a higher value for uh, hydrogen concentration but it is giving maximum around 30 percentage at 900 Kelvin and after that the water gas shift reaction predominates thereby a decrease in the hydrogen concentration. As more and more steam is being introduced, the reforming reaction takes place yielding more hydrogen. And this is uh, methane which is very minute in percentage and of course the CO2 also. 
and this is the effect of the air supply or air equivalence ratio ER and of course you can see as the more air is supplied we will be having more CO2 and lesser amount of hydrogen in concentration in the producer gas and of course this is the variation for uh, carbon dioxide and uh, methane with respect to the air as well as steam injection and this energy efficiency we have uh, it's your 80 percentage maximum energy efficiency so corresponding to 0.22 air equivalence ratio and also you can see the low heating value maximum we obtained 7.57 megajoules per normal meter cube for the producer gas and this is this table which represents the um, energy efficiency and exergy efficiency at various parametric values and um, so optimum value we have found out see we have to concentrate on maximum hydrogen concentration we have to concentrate on minimum sorry maximum energy efficiency also so we have done an optimization process so based on that we got the maximum hydrogen as 34.6 percent dkg by means of air steam gasification and the optimum condition for uh, temperature is 900 kelvin equivalence ratio 0.15 percentage of the stoichiometric air content steam to biomass ratio 2.5 <coughs> in terms of mass then moisture content 5 percentage and maximum 7.57 megajoules per normal meter cube heating value gas has been obtained and we have validated based on the literature data we have considered several bio, several uh, gasifiers including bubbling fluid ice bed downdraft etc and pine soda test pine bark sludge waste that has been taken only only thing is that we have to input the approximate analysis data of all these biomasses so that it will be simulated so this is the experimental validation you can see the hydrogen rmc is 3.78 yes and it's around well under within control so it says that the model is robust and the major conclusion is that uh, we have developed a unique model in aspen plus for air steam gasification and which is 96.3 percentage accurate considering the concentration of all the gases and uh, syngas concentration is around 30 to 40 percentage and excessive addition of steam is not advisable in terms of increasing the decreasing the energy efficiency and also we need to have a better model including the hydrodynamics because uh, uh, it, it includes uh, fluid dynamics as well as heat reactions so we have to take into account the hydro, uh, hydrodynamic on, hydrodynamics also so we need to have a better CFD model for that so that's it thank you thank you Sridhi and uh, if, if there is any question from the audience you can ask does the steam air oxidation increase the heat value of the gases compared to this without the steam? Yes. So if I send a pure air versus if I send a air to the gasifier, I produce a gases, you know, the heating value we have come to 10 percent natural gas, and into the steam, your heating value goes up or comes down as steam remains in no, no, sir, it will increase because as we introduce more steam, so we will be having more content of hydrogen in the producer gas mixture. So, so ma the major contributing factors for the heating value is hydrogen as well as carbon monoxide. So, hydrogen content increases, so obviously that the heating value of the gas will increase yeah. compared to the pure air case. Yeah. Uh, what I saw there was that you have about 8,500 Kilojoules per standard cubic meter, which is still yeah. about 12% of the natural gas value. It's not the way 8.5 megajoules per normal meter. Yeah, that's the maximum we obtained within the simulation range. Yes. Thank you. Can we use also approximate analysis to estimate? We are doing a similar number on the report. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sridhar. And next. Next uh, conducted talk is uh, by Krishna Kant Divedi and uh, Pradeep Kumar Chatterjee, Madhati Kumar Kamukar and Ajita Kumar Kamani. And the topic is experimental study on pyrolysis of coal by thermodynamic analysis under different temperature conditions. And it will be presented by Krishna Kant Divedi. Good evening to all of you, myself Krishna Kandu Vedi from NIT Dhrubhapur. Today I am going to explain about the experimental study by TGA for the coal pyrolysis in temperature, different temperature conditions. These are the some outlines of the presentation, introduction and experimental work, results, conclusion and reference. 
बेसिकली पायरोलिसिस और पोल इज अ थर्मोकेमिकल डीकंपोजिशन ऑफ पोल एट द एलिवेटेड टेंपरेचर इन द एब्सेंस ऑफ ऑक्सीजन और इन प्रेजेंस ऑफ द नाइट्रोजन विद द हेल्प ऑफ पायरोलिसिस ऑफ पोल वी कैन फिगर आउट द इग्निशन रेट ऑफ कंबक्शन एंड पार्टिकल इमिशन बाय यूजिंग थर्मोग्रेवमेटिक एनालिसिस और टीजीए इज अ सिंपल एंड एक्यूरेट मेथड टू डिटरमाइन द मास लॉस और वेट लॉस विद रिस्पेक्ट टू टेंपरेचर These are the some explanation of the experimental work. First is the sample sample preparation. The whole sample for that for this experiment basically collected from the Eastern Coal Field Limited, Ranigan. Collected coal samples are kept for the sun drying or required that to distribute in the two to three day or particle size twenty five to thirty five and then twenty five to thirty six then thirty six to fifty two then fifty two to seventy two microns. And last is a hundred to one fifty microns. So it is for the TGA experiment. Next is a proximate and ultimate analysis has been carried out by ASTM D five three seven three method at CSIR Simpal Dhanwar. Then about TGA, all the experiment are performed using next year thermal analyzer at CSIR CMRI Durgapur. In each experiment, ten gram of coal samples for the different particle size as explained before are placed on an L two. With a crucible in a nitrogenous atmosphere, with the flow rate of 40 mL per minute, up to the temperature maximum temperature is 950 and the starting temperature is room temperature 30 degrees Celsius. In order to see the temperature effect, experiment are performed for the four different heat rate. These are the 50, 100, and 160 to 200 Kelvin per minute. This is the experimental setup for the thermogravimetric analysis at CSIR CMIR Durgapur. We can see sample holder diaphragm pump and the thermostat. At the sample holder, we can put the full sample or biomass sample for the test mold for 10 gram or 15 gram or 12 gram. These are the results for approximate or ultimate analysis. We can see the volatile metal as fixed carbon and By ultimate analysis, we can calculate the content for the CHNSO. Some TG profiles for the different heating rate. As we can see, TG profiles for the heating rate 50 Kelvin per minute, 100 Kelvin per minute, then 160 Kelvin per minute, and last is the 160 and 200 Kelvin per minute. These are the TG profiles for the whole sample. Some derivatives. Profile for the coal sample for the same four different heating rate. I mean 50 Kelvin, 100 Kelvin, 160 Kelvin, and last is the 200 Kelvin per minute. Conclusion: TG and DTG curves for all the coal samples shows the weight loss of the coal particle. The first stage is dehydration stage. It, uh, it is uh, from 35 to 150 degree Celsius. The moisture is completely removed from the coal sample for this temperature range. The second stage is the primary or attractive pyrolysis for the temperature 200 to 450 degrees Celsius. When the maximum weight loss occurred in the process because of weight loss, and the third stage is the passive pyrolysis stage for the temperature range 450 to 950 degrees Celsius. There are a small amount of the complex compound also further degraded because of the high temperature range. It is a 950 degrees Celsius. The ignition temperature of the coal sample is basically affected by the some volatile metal. These are the some references related to the TGA experimental analysis for coal. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can come here. So if you do not have any question, I can ask one question. So you have uh, studied one whole sample. Yes, or one whole sample for the different particles. For the different particles. So what? What is the effect of the, the particle size? Actually, the basic effect on the heating rate. Yes. The uh, we can calculate the uh, kinetic study. We can calculate activation energy and the exponential factor. So if the heating rate is continuously increases, then the activation energy also decreases. Yes. What is the gas medium used?